Um, next, up next, we have uh, Suresh Sethi, who uh, will be talking about um, estimating the number of contributors to DNA mixtures, uh, which is a new novel to the biology. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking around. So this is going to be a methods uh, lecture, if you will, but um, I will have some data, so hang tight. Um, what I'm going to be introducing in this talk is a novel tool we've developed um, to apply genetics to fish and wildlife ecology, specifically to take advantage of mixtures of DNA to count how many contributors must have been in that mixture. So if this works, we can provide a new means of getting counts that we can use to inform fish and wildlife ecology. And probably a lot of you have seen talks through this symposium um, that use counts as the fundamental information. We use it for species distribution modeling, for uh, enumerating abundance of populations, for estimating, uh, quanti quantifying predation. Um, so there's a lot of application for this if, if we can get it to work. And so my goal for this talk is to outline the estimator. I'll show you some simulation results. We'll show some laboratory results and then a small field trial to try to convince you that this tool uh, can actually work. Okay, so uh, what is a DNA mixture? DNA ultimately sources from specimens, but mixtures of DNA from multiple specimens are really ubiquitous in the environment. Uh, we take advantage of DNA mixtures already in genetics, at least indirectly, uh, when we're doing eDNA sampling. Often we're getting multiple individuals in that sample. Um, there has been a lot of interest recently in taking eDNA and trying to infer abundance from it. Um, it. We've heard some talks in this genetics portion already about quantitative PCR. The idea here would be that if you can take a mixture sample that's representing multiple specimens, that the more specimens are there, the more quantity of DNA would be there. We should see a positive relationship. There have been a number of papers out recently in the past three, four, five years attempting to do this. Here's one of them, La Cousière Roussel. They used uh, as an index of relative abundance gill netting biomass, and then they quantify the amount of DNA. And there is a positive relationship, but you can see it's pretty messy. Uh, we were hoping to improve upon that through a radically different way of trying to enumerate specimens from DNA mixtures. And it's called allele counting. Uh, we can go through a little cartoon here to see how this works. Uh, consider diploid organisms. So they have two copies of an allele at any one locus. And let's say we take a sample on a DNA mixture, we get a genotype out of it, and we see that each locus only has one or two alleles. Well, that's providing us information that there's probably only a single individual in that mixture. But let's suppose, genotyping error aside for now, um, that we take another sample from mixture and one of the loci comes up with three alleles. Well, we know just by simple math there had to be at least two individuals in that mixture to exhibit three distinct alleles. And this type of logic can scale up across loci. Now there has, there was one, uh, we found one other paper that attempted a similar type of analysis. Uh, this is a very interesting paper by Carrion Martinez, also from scientists here in the Great Lakes region. Um, and they used an allele counting approach, but they used a heuristic simulation based approach to try to determine how many alleles should we see at a given locus um, as a function of number of contributors to that mixture. So what they did, they were working off yellow perch larvae. They, they uh, genotyped individuals, and then they used simulation to artificially construct mixtures, and they came up with these empirical relationships that you would expect with the cumulative number of alleles you would observe in a mixture with more and more individuals in that mixture. So this is a really interesting approach. You can see that there was a nice correspondence between more fish, more alleles in the mixture, but there's these plateaus, these discontinuities, there's variability year to year, and it's less straightforward to scale this up across the low side and make one determination about how many individuals are in that mixture. So we're looking to improve upon that, and we've developed a maximum likelihood estimator, so bringing this into a fully statistical inferential approach. Now it turns out, um, the interwebs are amazing, because it turns out there's already a maximum likelihood model um, that with slight modification could be applied in, in this context in ecological setting. And I found it in the criminal forensics literature. This is the beast up here, and I'll, I'll unpack this a little bit. It's actually much less complicated than it looks, but um, I thought it was quite interesting. This was actually developed to determine how many perpetrators were involved in sexual crimes. It's also the similar mathematics have been used to identify remains at terrorist sites. So this has kind of a dark history, but we can use it in ecology as well. Um, so to unpack this just, just briefly so that um, uh, 
to convince you that we all can use this thing, even though it looks gnarly. All of this stuff, the summations, the factorials, that's all combinatorics, just trying to tell us how many different ways you can allocate alleles among the individuals. But the core of this is just simply how many alleles did we, or which alleles did we see in the mixture and what is their allele frequency. So the point I want to make is um, the two ingredients that we need to use this, this is again trying to resolve how many contributors made up a mixture um, with a single species, again here we're not doing any kind of uh, meta species analysis, is simply the genotype of the mixture, so the unique set of alleles that are observed, and then associated allele frequencies for those. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna show you a few graphs like this, and I'm gonna try to go through this quickly. <laughs> Criminal forensics. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, so just so you can navigate these, what we're doing here is we're uh, simulating mixtures and then we're simulating genotypes from those mixtures and then applying our estimator. This is just standard statistical practice when developing a new estimator to make sure that our estimator actually works and is unbiased. So these are biased plots. Zero means we got the answer correct. On the x-axis here are larger numbers of loci. These were simulating from microsatellite type markers, i.e. loci that have many alleles. And the main thing I want to point out here is, are two, two bookends. When we simulate mixtures with a single individual, we get it correct every single time with this estimator. So that's a good kind of gut check, that if this is telling us that there's only one individual in the mixture, we get it right. But we can go all the way up to 10 individuals, and if we have high allelic richness to moderate allelic richness, so 20, 10 alleles per locus, we can resolve these mixtures very accurately with 20, 30 microsatellite panels. 20, 30, 40, 50 microsatellites, this is kind of becoming standard practice size panels. We saw from Nina's talk that millions of markers are coming down the, um, coming down the pike. We can also do this simulation with SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, biallelic markers, only two alleles. And we can get similar performance, although we need relatively large panels, a thousand SNPs. But again, you know, as you saw from Nina's talk, for those of you that were able to join, uh, it's, that's kind of the standard now. We can get very large SNP panels. Okay, so this thing works in theory. We can resolve up to 10 individual contributing mixtures or more. Again, because this is a maximum likelihood estimator, the more and more loci we get, the more power we get. So we can keep going. If we want to invest in this, we can resolve much larger mixtures. Uh, but anyone that works with genetics knows that genotyping error is a constant problem. So we wanted to do some simulations to see how does this estimator work um, for counting individuals in a mixture in the face of genotyping errors. So two common genotyping errors we face are calling the wrong allele, so a false allele, or alleles can drop out for numerous reasons. And we simulated low and high levels of error. Long story short, uh, the grays are high or low error, and you can see that the results are basically the same with the black dots here, which are no error. So this thing is robust to standard types of genotyping error. The intuition here is, again, we're just trying to get observe the unique set of alleles in a mixture. So um, even if we have some error in there and we can compound across low side to gain strength of evidence, it's actually quite robust. Now there's one other type of error that we have to, have to consider for using this mixture estimator because we have to give it allele frequency. So this is perhaps the biggest constraint when actually rolling this out because we do need a sample from the population to get the, relative, the relevant allele frequencies. So we also looked at simulating error with those. Long story short, uh, microsatellites are actually really robust to this, so if we're going to use this um, as a tool, I'd recommend using microsatellite type um, markers to estimate number of contributors to DNA mixtures. SNPs were much more sensitive, although, uh, so this looks like there's been a lot um, uh, higher bias when we have error in the minor allele frequency estimates we're trying to achieve, but this is a little bit overblown because it's a much simpler task to um, estimate a single allele frequency for biallelic SNPs. Um, so probably both will work, but um, we're actually proceeding with downstream analyses that I'll talk a little bit about with microsatellites. Okay, so that's enough with the, the simulation land. What about going to the laboratory now? Controlled setting, can we actually this, the, get genotypes from DNA mixtures and then use our estimator? So what I'm going to show you here are a number of trials we did in the lab using yellow perch DNA that we extracted and just pipetted into mixtures brand genotypes with those with a conventional off-the-shelf, I'm calling it off-the-shelf, um, 14 loci microsat panel. Uh, Wes Larson is the collaborator on this project, so he's responsible for getting the genotypes out of these mixtures. And our first thing was to look at simulating mixtures of up to five individuals 
um, with high and equal strength DNA. And we see that our average bias was within one individual, plus or minus. So actually what we expect from our simulations with the, you know, the fact that we are going to have some genotyping error when we actually are generating genotypes from real DNA. Uh, we also looked at reducing full strength concentration DNA to half to 10%. And um, at these lower concentration levels, our baseline was two nanograms. We're still getting the same performance, good performance. When we get to one one hundredth the concentration, then we start to see downward bias. So there is going to be a lower limit to the amount of DNA we can detect. I mean, we expect that with any type of genotyping or, or eDNA sampling. Um, and then finally, the last thing we looked at, again, thinking about how we might experience mixtures in the environment, it's probably very unlikely that all specimens contributing to a mixture are going to give the same amount of DNA. So we looked at asymmetric concentrations. And the same thing, again, we get good performance until you get individuals that, are, that have very tiny amounts of DNA. Then they start to drop out of the mixture. But all in all, pretty robust. Okay, last thing now. So we've gone we've got in silico, we've gone in laboratorium. Now we're going to go in situ. So what we did here was uh, rolled out a little field trial looking at using DNA mixtures to estimate the number of yellow perch prey in a, in a uh, charismatic predator, predator largemouth bass. Now the conventional approach here would be you collect stomachs, you open them up and use visual assessment to count prey items. But that's tricky to do because they digest quickly. So um, we did a, a comparison trial here. We got 15 bass stomachs from a lake in Wisconsin and uh, Dan Eiserman had his undergrad class process these, so it was good, um, good use of, of student help. Um, and what we found was that only two of the stomachs actually had yellow perch that we could visually identify in them for a total of three specimens. Uh, there were a lot of other unknown fish that we couldn't identify because they were mush or just a few hard parts that were undecipherable. Um, so if we were to do the conventional visual estimate, we would say in a snapshot in time, the predation rate would be 0.2 perch per bass. We took those stemic contents, made a slurry out of them, extracted DNA, and then ran that through our uh, yellow perch microsat panel and used our DNA mixture estimator, and this is the results we get. So we get 13 out of 15 stomachs actually showing yellow perch. Many of them have multiple specimens, uh, some of which were not picked up at all by the visual estimates. When we scale this up, we actually get almost a six-fold increase in the estimated predation rate by using genetics tools to identify how many individuals were in those stomachs. So this has been pretty exciting. We're actually now trying to um, get a large project going to look at uh, threatened Chinook salmon, juvenile Chinook salmon predation on the Sacramento River. Um, so stay tuned if in four years if we actually get funded. <laughs> um, any rate, so uh, I'm gonna wrap this up again. This is just trying to introduce you guys to a new tool, um, hopefully convince you that it can work. There are going to be technical challenges with DNA mixtures because it's not trivial to get genotypes from nuclear DNA and mixture. Um, but we're getting better and better. The technology is moving very quickly. So I don't think that's going to be a permanent obstacle in many applications. And ultimately, what we would like to do with this and the excitement about this is that this is a way, this is a tool, a statistical inferential tool, that we can take eDNA and move beyond presence absence and actually make it a count based tool, which would be quite exciting. And actually, we have a grad student at Cornell working on this right now. We've put round, round Gobi is going to be our model system. We've put them in buckets. Uh, we've extracted water. And we're actually able to reconstruct genotypes from that. So the next step, once we get the bioinformatics pipeline worked out, um, is going to be trying it out in the field. So please stay tuned for that. And the last thing I'll point out here, too, is um, you know we, we, we hear a lot about new genetics tools. But um, I just want to throw a plug in there for statisticians and quantitative ecologists because uh, we should also be thinking about the tools we use to, to analyze those data. And so um, I think ultimately this DNA mixture estimator makes a great marriage with some of the newer hierarchical ecological models that are really popular amongst us um, quantitative ecologists because they deal with imperfect detection. So whether we're doing eDNA or we're try, um, for presence absence or counting, we have a whole field of statistics that have um, that have burgeoned in the past five years that can deal with imperfect detection. So I just kind of alert everyone that talk to your quantitative ecologist by efforts. Um, at any rate, so I'm going to leave it there. If you'd like more details, uh, we have a paper out on, on the um, estimator uh, that just came out and um, refer you to that or come see me. All right. <laughs>